Hi, Dr. Z. What are you doing? Oh, hi, Roberta. I'm so glad you're here. I am heading to Greenland to study the polar bears, and I just cannot find any clothes to wear. All my clothes are geared towards the San Diego warm climate over here. Oh, I see. Well, perhaps we could all put our heads together and help you solve this problem, Dr. Z. We don't mean to interrupt your vigorous search, but our audience is already here and ready to begin. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of San Diego Zoo Kids Corner. I am Dr. Zoolittle. I cannot wait to share my stories and adventures with you. So let's explore the natural world together. Buckle up, because we're about to bring the zoo to you. Packing. What special things do you guys wear to keep you warm? Long pants, a jacket, warm socks, gloves. My boy, you cannot go without a scarf. Our family heirloom. Oh, and a scarf. Huh. That's a great idea. You know, I wonder what animals do to stay warm. You don't see a polar bear with scarves and jackets and gloves. That makes me wonder. What special designs do animals have to keep them warm? Oh, I know just the person to talk about all of this. Our friend Michelle recently went to another cold place on a winter trip to Montana. Let's see if she can lend us any advice. As I stared out of the window this morning, preparing to venture into the great outdoors of Montana, I realized it was going to be very different than hiking in sunny California, but I was ready for the challenge. I'm feeling pretty good. Sorry, <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good. I think I should be able to stay pretty warm out there. Let's go. All these layers did keep me warmer for a while, but the longer I stay out here, the colder I get. And I'm exhausted. My body is working overtime trying to keep me warm, which makes me wonder, how do animals survive in this type of weather? Actually, animals have very similar tools to the things you're using right now to help you brave the cold. Wait, who, who said that? Uh, up here. Hi, I'm Jeff the Nature Guy. Hey. You know, here at Zoo Montana, we know a little something about snow. In fact, here in Billings itself, we get over 100 inches per year. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed. I am freezing. How do animals do this 24-7? You know, Michelle, the funny thing is some animals don't. Animals like elk, believe it or not, they'll migrate to warmer areas, and the bears, they have it best of all. They'll find a den, and they'll just sleep the winter away. Yeah, that seems more like it. I cannot imagine that animals would be able to survive out here for more than just a couple of hours. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to think about animals living in this environment, but some animals, oh, they do it so well. In fact, one of my favorites, one of the more beautiful animals in our state, the Canada lynx, and they are so well adapted for the winter time in the snow, it's just crazy. Hey, do you mind if I use a little bit of your space here to do a quick flashback? What? We saw that Michelle put a coat on before going outside, and the lynx has one as well. Coats are a great tool to help keep us warm, and they do two very important things to combat the weather. The soft inner part helps to keep our body heat in, and the outer shell works to keep the wet and cold out. But it isn't just your core that needs to stay warm. Hands and feet can get chilly pretty quick when you're out in the snow. Michelle had gloves and tons of extra socks, whereas the lynx, well, they have a bunch of extra fur. The added padding and coverage keeps them both insulated from the cold. But all that extra padding also serves another purpose for the lynx. If you remember, when Michelle originally tried to walk in the snow, she had trouble because she was missing the proper footwear. But if you spread that weight out, 
through a larger area like a snowshoe or a giant lynx foot, it helps you to walk a lot easier. So you see, some animals are pretty well adapted for the cold weather, much better than humans. That's for sure. I am just about ready to head inside and thaw out. How's this? Much better. Yeah. Dr. Z, you haven't even left on your trip yet and you're already drinking hot chocolate to warm up? Roberta, I am doing research. And part of my research is seeing if hot chocolate will warm me up. And do you know what I learned from Michelle and Jeff from Zoo Montana? I am going to have to exchange my flippers for some snowshoes. And I have to exchange my goggles for a buff. Okay, I think we're off to a good start making sure you're ready for the icy cold tundra, Dr. Z. Do you know, Roberta, good is what the hot chocolate is, but it's not great. I need a great cup of hot chocolate for my trip. And there's only one person that can help me do that. And that is Chef Zoolittle. Hello, my friends, and welcome. Chef Zoolittle here with another tasty treat just for you. I know that you know polar bears love to swim, but did you know that they love to swim in hot chocolate? Come, let me show you. All right, let's begin by having a look at our ingredients. We are going to need one jumbo-sized marshmallow, one regular-sized marshmallow cut in half. We're going to need half of that. We'll need two miniature marshmallows, two of these adorable little candy eyes, one of your favorite small chocolate treats, and then, oh, about a tablespoon's worth of white chocolate chips. We're going to begin by throwing these into the microwave. I'll start with about 30 seconds just to make sure they're good and melty. Here we go. All right, it's been 30 seconds in the microwave. Let's see. Ooh, yes, indeed. My white chocolate chips are looking nice and melty as I give them a little stir with my spatula here. Now, this is going to be the glue for our craft project today. And here is where we begin. Let's grab the cut side of that half of the medium-sized marshmallow, put a little bit of our glue right here on the back, and that shall form the snout of our polar bear friend. Next up, how about just a teeny bit of glue on the back of the eyes. There we go, there's one. And two. Now we need a little bit of glue for the back of his nose. There we have it. And finally, some glue for his ears. What do you say, Mr. Polar Bear? Are you ready to take a swim in some hot chocolate? Yes, I am, Dr. Zoolittle. Well, let's go then. All right, well, it looks like my polar bear friends are ready for their swim. I have my nice steaming cup of hot cocoa right here, and I just whipped up a lovely batch of fresh whipped cream. All that takes is about one quarter cup of heavy whipping cream, along with about a teaspoon of sugar and a teaspoon of vanilla extract and there we have a nice floating home for our polar bear friend and he goes right on top there perfect well there you have it my friends a delicious polar bear treat thank you so much for joining me i am chef zoolittle see you next time I knew that Chef Zoolittle would have the perfect recipe for a delicious cup of hot chocolate, and he did not disappoint. All right, Roberta, I think it's time to go back to packing. And Roberta, I'm going to need your help to make sure that I am 100% ready. I have an idea. Let's take a look at some other animals that live in cold climates and see if we can get some inspiration. This animal changes the color of its coat, so it's always in season. Fun fact about Arctic foxes. In summer, they sport a thinner two-tone brown coat. For winter, they grow a heavy white coat. Changes in the hours of daylight between summer and winter help to trigger this change. This animal is always on the move to warmer climates. Fun fact about caribou, 
caribou are known for their migrations. They stay together in herds, moving almost constantly. The spring migration is the furthest they go in the shortest time and can be as much as over 600 miles. This animal has a built-in insulating blanket of blubber. Fun facts about polar bears. A polar bear has a blubber layer about four inches thick that helps to keep it warm. Blubber, what a great word that is, blubber. I love saying it, blubber, blubber. You know, four inches of blubber is a lot and I'm gonna see who's got more blubber, me or the polar bear. I've got tongs and I've got a ruler. Okay, here goes. Oh, it's ticklish. Okay, here we go. Oh. Okay, I'm getting it out. Okay, let's get the ruler in there. All right, the polar bear won, but barely. Next time I intend to take the prize. Now we have to see how blubber works. And there's only one person that can help us out. My identical twin brother and his assistant, Maisie. Hi everybody, Dr. Zulil here. Now, um, we all know that animals that live in cold environments are able to withstand sub-zero air temperatures and icy cold waters. How are they able to do this? We're gonna find out. I'm here with my assistant. My name's Maisie. Absolutely. Now, uh, here is step one. You're going to need a bowl of ice water. Uh, step two, um, you want to have a glove or um, you can also use a Ziploc bag, turn it inside out, put it on your hand. Now, we're going to take one of the gloves, the one that Maisie has, and we're going to add oil or shortening. In this case, I have a coconut oil. So we're going to just turn your hand over. There we go. We're going to just put coconut oil everywhere, all over the glove. Now we're going to then take that hand and stick it into a Ziploc bag. All right, there we go. We're going to just kind of close that up as much as we possibly can. There we go, Maisie. All right, fantastic. Now make sure you got it all over that hand there. There we go. All right, now I am going to just stick my hand into a empty plastic bag so that I don't, she doesn't have any advantage. Now, Maisie and I are going to stick our hands into this cold water and see who can keep their hand in the cold water the longest. Are you ready? Here we go. And... Oh, my goodness. Okay. That... Oh. All right, I can't do it anymore. That's too cold. Is that cold? You're doing it? Ladies and gentlemen, the scientific experiment. How come yours isn't cold? Because there's this. It's like blubber. Yeah, you should have blubber. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Zulil. Out. Isn't it cool that blubber can insulate animals? But not all animals in cold environments rely on blubber. One of my favorite, fluffiest marine mammals, the sea otter, spends almost all of its time in very cold water, but surprisingly has no blubber at all. Wait a minute, Roberta, wait a minute. Are you telling me that the sea otter has zero blubber? So how does it stay warm? Perhaps Christine from the Audubon Aquarium can help shed some light on how our otter friends have adapted to the cold. Audubon Aquarium of the Americas today and we're going to meet a very special otter. Her name is Clara. Clara is a southern sea otter and they are from the central coast of California. Today Clara is going to be getting a very special training session and it's going to be one where we're going to be checking her coat. Sea otters have a very special fur coat that is made up of two layers. There is an undercoat and a top coat and a layer of air in between. Now, sea otters are able to blow air into their coat as a part of their grooming to put that layer of air there, and it is what helps keep that cold water from touching their skin, that barrier of air. 
Clara does a really great job of checking and grooming her own fur. In fact, she spends about 40% of her day doing just that, grooming her fur coat. That's a lot of time, and it's well spent because her coat is in great condition. This coat check behavior lets the trainers get up close and personal with Clara to make sure that we're 100% sure that she is healthy and her coat is where it should be. in her exhibit. Claire's friend is named Ruby, who is also a southern sea otter. She was abandoned as a one-day-old pup. And because Ruby didn't have a lot of that time with her mom that she would in the wild, she didn't learn how to groom her fur coat as well as Clara does. But Clara is more than happy to step in and help her comb out all the mats and make sure that Ruby is successful in keeping warm by keeping this fur coat where it should be. Okay, so it looks like I need the perfect coat. Thanks, Mommy. And now all I'm missing are bubbles. Hello there, brother. I'm out in doing research on otters and oh, I hear that you want me to show everyone how to make bubble solution so let's do that right here right now so everyone you're going to need a few items first up you're going to need one cup of liquid detergent you're going to need 16 cups of water and you're going to make a slurry out of something called raw gum so to do that you will also need alcohol and you'll need a teaspoon and you'll need a small container so let's do that first we're going to make our slurry. So, we're going to get this out. Teaspoon comes out, and who remembers what this was called? That's right, guar gum. It goes into this container. We're going to now just cover it with alcohol. And we're doing this because it is a very fine particulate. And we're going to try and suspend that particulate in our, with our solvent, our alcohol solvent, so we don't get, let's see, what is that technical word? Clumps, that's right. Clump. See right here? Oh yes, that looks very unclumpy. That's good. Now wait a second, I seem to be forgetting something. <gasps> That's right, we need a bowl. Here we are. All right, so now we go ahead and we put in our one cup of liquid detergent and we put in our 16 cups of water. But what I'm trying to do is not make small bubbles. So do it very gently as you pour in your water. That's right, here we go. One more and we'll be at 16 cups with our mason jars. There we excellent. Now, we shake our slurry one more time just to get all those particulates so they're suspended. We put it in, here we go, nice. And we gently fold it around because we're trying not to make small bubbles. Uh-oh, look at this. Small bubbles, no, no. No small bubbles in our bubble solution. No, no. Now this is going to be fantastic. I'm actually going to dip these wands in right up. Wait, wait a second, why don't I just use my hand? Here we go. Ah! Let me catch some. Ah! <laughs> ah! There we go, well, let's try this. What I did here was I took some cotton rope and I put it on two sticks and I can make big bubbles. Oh, look at that. I'm going to make lots of big bubbles later, that's right. Bubbles everywhere. All right, back to you, brother. Okay, I have everything I need. I've got my coat, I've got my blubber, I've packed the bubbles, I think I am all set. Dr. Z, you've been doing an excellent job with packing. I think it might be time for a little joke break, and I've chosen just the right jokes to get you excited for your research trip. Why do bears have fur coats? Because they look silly in a sweater vest. <laughs> what do you call a bear without fur? Bear! <laughs> what 
does a grizzly wear under his fur? Under bear. <laughs> okay, okay, no more bear jokes. Oh wait, hold on. Forget it. Oh, Roberta, you are driving me fur crazy. In fact, Roberta, I have got a Z mail from Jeremy, who's six years old from Maryland, and Jeremy sent in the most amazing joke. He asks, "What is the funniest animal?" Turtle Rex. <laughs> Jeremy, a Turtle Rex? That is an excellent joke. I bet you wrote that joke all by yourself. Jeremy, six years old, you are amazing. If you want to get your name on the air and you want to get your joke on the air, all you have to do is send us an email at zmail, Z stands for zebra and zoo little, mail at sandiegozoo.org. Get a grown up to help you. And if we choose your joke, we'll make sure to mention your name on the air. Thanks to the help of our audience and our guests on the show. I think you have finally got everything you need there, Dr. Z. Absolutely, Roberta. I learned so much from the animals on how to stay warm. From the lynx, I realized the importance of a coat, some warm socks, and some snowshoes. From Clara, the sea otter, I learned the importance of bubbles. And of course, we can't forget our blubber. But I don't need to pack anything special for that one. And I had a delicious cup of hot chocolate, thank you to Chef Zoolittle. So now all that's left is for me to see a polar bear. What an exciting time we had! I'm hoping on our next trip, we may be able to visit these habitats sent into us. Check out this savanna habitat from Ian in Minnesota. Or this habitat from our friend Lily in New Mexico. Wow, those habitats look a whole lot warmer than where I'm going. You know, if you could choose any habitat to visit, what would that habitat be? In fact, why don't you email us and let us know? You can send us your jokes, your poems, your stories, your questions, and the place you'd like to go visit. Send them to us at Z, which stands for Zebra and Zoo Little, mail at sandiegozoo.org. Get a grown up to help you, and if we use your joke, your story, your poem, your question, or the place you'd like to go visit, we'll mention your name on the air. In the meantime, keep wandering and exploring about nature. Until we see you next time, stay curious, my friends. Stay curious. Thank <laughs> you.